Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem Iskander. Hey, everyone, Matt DiNapoli here. Welcome to episode 133 of Snack Minute. Uh, this week, we are talking to the VP of DevNet, Shannon McFarland, and my manager. So, Shannon, welcome. Uh, you've been with us before. Um, what has changed in that time? I, th- I think this was maybe 18 months ago or so. <laughs> uh, but what has changed, and how do you find yourself now the, the VP of DevNet? Well, first, thanks for having me back on. Uh, I wasn't sure, based upon the last one that we did together on stage at Cisco Live, uh, if I would be invited back. But uh, but here I am. <laughs> um, we're now in the middle of celebrating uh, DevNet's 10-year anniversary. And uh, you talked about reinforcing what DevNet's done in the past. But uh, how do you see the um, evolution of DevNet and, and what we can help provide to the customer base, the developer community, the partner community moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if you look back at the last 10 years, uh, you know, this this last August, uh, it's been a winning formula, right? I mean, you take a look at the inception of, of what DevNet came uh, to be, and that is uh, not only an education engine, but an enablement engine for customers and partners to be able to understand how to programmatically interact with, with Cisco's products and services. And Um, That has been a very winning formula. And so what we want to go through now and into the future is continue that winning formula. But we also have to understand that uh, the Cisco of 10 years ago is not necessarily the Cisco of today or the Cisco of even next year. And and so there are these new spaces that we're entering in, you know, a software oriented company. Uh, Cloud native technologies are finally starting to, even though we've been talking about them for a while, proliferate into, uh, you know, different market segments, enterprises and and so forth. But also there's all these new kind of things that we've danced around a little bit with DevNet in the past around not just the dev, you know, the developer turned operator, the operator turned developer, whatever combination you find yourself in in that space. But we also have this uh, kind of shift where, full stack developers or a cloud native developer or somebody who believed they were only a front end developer on, you know, React or whatever it is, are actually finding either new roles and responsibilities landing on them to touch infrastructure, to touch things that have a Cisco brand. Um, and so we've got to be, be able to not only take the winning formula that we've had in the last 10 years um, for our traditional Cisco oriented uh, audience, uh, we, we also have to have, you know, make some space in there for those specific personas that are really, they don't understand uh, how to programmatically interact with Cisco, even though the tools, the languages, and the technologies are the same things they churn through every day. Uh, we've just got to make it easier for them to be able to interact with us programmatically. And so I think that's one of the the new slices that that we'll see over probably the next 24 months is our customer base tells us we are kind of morphing the roles and responsibilities of historical main line of business developers and we are sprinkling in added responsibilities around security observability etc and so i think that uh, one of the areas one of many areas that we've got uh, to, to work on in, in the Cisco DevNet space is is helping that audience. Can you tell us a little bit, like, so been in DevNet and I, you, you know, I was part of the that inception and we did, we went out, we were set out to to change the mindset of the, the traditional network engineer into a programmatical kind of automation engineer. And so we've done a great job at that. Now that I'm looking at DevNet from the outside, what is new and exciting from a from a technical perspective that I would I, sh- I will be seeing coming out of the organization now? There's, you know, kind of three pillars, if you will, of of what I would consider to be uh, our motion going kind of to the left of the shift left kind of world where we want to go to where these developers are, speak the language engage them in the tools and engage them in the areas, whether that's a forum, hackathons, et cetera, that we want to go after. And so there's this technological space that we need to enter into um, or at least reinforce what we've already been doing in that space. Um, And some new areas that we've we've got in there to help folks uh, onboard or programmatically um, use our stuff in a better way is obviously we get the traditional sandboxes and the learning labs and all that other stuff. 
But we've got things like, uh, you know, the the, the NSO uh, tool set that allows people to have a live programmatic environment for them to go in and say, if NSO is my thing, how do I actually work through my automation engine through uh, that NSO framework, right? And so we're, we're really reinforcing the hands-on approach to what we've got to do uh, from, from an enablement point of view. Um, I also think that in partnership with other groups, Panoptica, the Cisco Full Stack Observability Team, uh, Meraki, many others, is bringing in uh, tool sets, whether they're better documented or more robust SDKs, or we're bringing in things like CICD integration with Panoptica that allows people to um, not only once they check in secure code, but that we can utilize something like a CI pipeline with external API checks and so forth to be able to allow them to technically keep things operationally secure as it moves through the pipeline, right? And so these tool sets um, are additive into what we're trying to do in, in the DevNet space. And then in the middle uh, area is how do we really go and help our business units uh, reinforce the programmatic nature of the audiences that may be consumers of their product, not necessarily the purchaser of the product, but how do we get those two linked up, right? And so I think those, uh, the areas around, uh, you know, you go to, uh, you know, DevNet zone and you can go into the design thinking kind of mindset there is like, how would I properly interact with Rocky dashboard and so forth? So that's a sprinkling of technologies and uh, efforts around education, but also technically, um, how do we go in and, and bring the developer advocacy feedback from our customers and partners back into the business institutions that need to go in and maybe uh, technically uh, update the code, update their interfaces and so forth. And so I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that's some of the stuff that we're working on. You know, being part of the team and knowing all of the <laughs> all the strategy that goes along with it, Shannon, um, you know, there that what you just said sounds like a big chunk of work that needs to be done. And, uh, you know, uh, fortunately or, or unfortunately, DevNet is, is a small but mighty team. And I wonder if you can uh, give our, our snackers a little bit of uh, insight into how you see us uh, scaling all that effort in as we grow into these other new areas of technology. Um, what are what are the opportunities that potentially snackers could look for or where are, there, you, or where are they going to see improvements over the next uh, year, maybe two years um, from DevNet in that area? I think that uh, you know, you if you show up to Cisco Live and you walk into DevNet Zone, it is just a it's a really cool place to be. I mean, even before I was here, it was my favorite place in all of Cisco Live to hang out. Um, one of I think the best assets that Cisco has on their behalf is developer.cisco.com, right? These are the faces of programmatic interaction with the company, whether you're physically at an event or you're you're coming to us from the web. Uh, but that DevNet brand that we have actually represents a multitude of other institutions that are our partners in this space, right? And so you look at, you know, Kareem, your group uh, from, you know, the learning and certifications group, we've got a, a group inside of Cisco that is the field programmability team that are geographically dispersed. So the ones that drive the DevNet test drive stuff for us. Uh, we've got events teams, marketing teams, and the business units and the developer advocates and TMEs and those teams, right? And so they are what I call the multiplier effect. They are the ones that take what uh, is derived uh, in partnering institutions like Kareem's group or our group within DevNet test drives or uh, you know learning labs and, and sandboxes and so forth. And you basically dump fuel on that fire, right? And that's where the <laughs> multiplier effect comes from is our field and our partners and all of these other players are actually what help back up the brand of Cisco DevNet. So I think what you're going to see over the next year or two years is probably two things uh, related to scale. The first one is we don't necessarily always have to carry the burden of doing first line education for everyone, right? If you look at Cisco U and some of those places, these are amazing assets by which someone that's either a new grad or new into a role needs to go learn GitHub or Python basics or fill in the blank. Um, those are spaces where we can scale by allowing them to inter you know, interact with, with other tool sets for that learning. The second part of it is, is that I think that as we kind of look at things as a pyramid, 
We've got this broad based responsibility of, of core education around the normal, what we would consider Cisco audience. Uh, these folks that interoperate with our products and services programmatically. Uh, but as I mentioned, we've got to make a little bit of space in there for these newcomers that are coming in. These could be people that are uh, interacting with maybe a WebEx assistant through AI, right? And so they're a developer, they're interoperating with that, but it's a new space for them. We don't understand how to programmatically use your assistants, right? And so uh, we've got to have a little bit of space in the next year or two for us to go after these brand new uh, not necessarily new personas, but the new technical consumption through that persona that we've got to go after. And a couple of places that we're doing that is things like, how do we properly, uh, you know, document backward compatibility and interaction with things that are like AI APIs or sustainable APIs, right? And so these types of areas are, are where we're going to go kind of from a broad-based education to very specific uh, use case oriented stuff um, and help guide some of these newcomers in the space to really understand how to use our stuff programmatically. So Shannon, I know you touched a little bit on, on, on AI and um, this is something that I've been wanting to actually have a conversation with the DevNet team on in, in general to learn more, but can you tell our snackers what is, where is what is Cisco doing from an AI perspective and what is DevNet's role in that motion? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, a, a multitude of, of motions going on on, you know, we've already been in the predictive space for a long time, right? That's kind of a yawner, you know, it's it's a, it's a table stakes for you to be able to predictively <laughs> look over data historically and make some sort of, uh, you know, groovy decision based upon that. But I think that, you know, the new kid on the block with generative um, is appearing in WebEx, it's appearing in security, it's appearing in, in observability in all kinds of places. And so each of the the business units, uh, uh, you know, really have, uh, you know, a pretty solid goal around, you know, AP or uh, AI for our product sets, right? Where you're injecting, you know, this, uh, chat functionality, for example, in, inside of WebEx or whatever. And then there's the other side of things where we are making things better for AI itself. And so this is with Silicon One and, and other spaces where we're enabling infrastructure to be to be in place and ready, kind of back in the old days of voice, right? Where we got an infrastructure ready with quality of service and all of these other things ready for voice and video to lay on that infrastructure. We're doing the same types of things for artificial enabled infrastructure as well. DevNet's part of that is basically continuing uh, the API quality and consistency routine that we've been in since, you know, the, the mid 2010s, you know, worlds when we really understood that, okay, there's this thing called API quality and there's these things like open API specifications and there's stuff like backward compatibility of the change logs and all this other stuff. That is a motion that DevNet takes that responsibility very seriously and it's something that we want to add things like AI best practices with APIs, um, you know, especially when you start looking at, uh, you know, the diversity of API types you can use in AI. It's not just REST, but GraphQL and WebSockets and all kinds of stuff find their way into an AI implementation. Um, and a part of that, you need good standard-based recommendation, proper documentation, proper guidance on when to use one thing versus another. And so I think DevNet's part in that, uh, Kareem, is to maintain what we're already doing, just adding the AI use cases and the specificity of the technologies involved there to that flow. What about sustainability? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think sustainability is 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 one of those things, right? It's like it's uh, it's it appears everywhere, right? It is like not just let me go poke a Meraki API so that I can pull what the power consumption is for you know a, a wireless access point or whatever. There's an entire view around development plus sustainability. Which languages do I choose for a specific use case that burns more CPU or memory or network IO or not, right? Um, and so I think sustainability is very much like AI or any voice or video or anything else. There is a consumption of something that you got to programmatically interact with it. And so, you know, APIs for sustainability is another space that I think DevNet uh, has got strong leadership in that we want to bring in. We also want to roll this stuff not only into from theoretical concerns, 
but also how do you get hands on with it? So if you look at, you know, learning labs and sandboxes and so forth, your ability to interact live with a Meraki dashboard, for example, write code that goes and does a get of something against that dashboard that pulls power consumption across an entire site. These types of things through sandbox and so forth are elements that we want to enable folks to use, not just here's the theory of it, but actually get hands-on practical experience with doing these things for AI sustainability, fill in the blank. Um, Shannon, thank you so much for the insight on that. It's really fun to talk about future opportunities and especially with um, you know AI, large language models, generative on top of the brain and sustainability, one of the driving focuses of Cisco going forward. It's really fun to see that, that DevNet is kind of leading the, the charge in the conversation. So thank you for that. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for you today. Um, this uh, conversation yep. actually went a little bit longer than I, I think we even expected. So um, I will just say this. Uh, thank you for, for taking the lead with the team. Um, I'm personally really excited about the direction of DevNet's future and, and everything that we're doing there. Um, it's been a, a good six months and I'm hoping for a great next couple of years. And so um, thank you for joining us on Snack Minute this week. And, and we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you, Thanks, Snackers, guys. for watching.